Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, December the 10th in the Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC. Um, I'd like to thank our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff who makes this program happen. The first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show. Hello, Walter. Hello, Jack. And I usually start off, and I've got something written down, because if I don't write it down, I won't remember the words. So, in my opinion, uh, the corporate-owned media in Canada is the number one greatest threat to our freedom and our democracy and our future. If we can't control the lies and propaganda of the corporate media and build a truly free press that works for us, then the media will destroy our country and our future. The corporations who own the media are the enemy, and we have to beat them. And it just goes on and on week after week. This week, a huge story was, was this. I'm sure everybody saw this picture. It was all over the television news, all over the radio. This is put out, supposedly, by ISIS. And basically, it's, it's ISIS recruit urges attack against Canadians. And I think what we're seeing here is the deliberate creation of fear. That's what the media is doing. Why would you take a comment made by some 22 or 23 year old punk somewhere and give it that kind of coverage unless you're trying to create fear. I mean, there are a, a thousand groups of people across Canada who are working on important and good things for the future of our country. Any one of them would love to even get a mention in the media, but they won't do it. But this, this is the kind of, it, they choose what they're going to show. For example, it's being widely reported. This threat comes from ISIS. It's being widely reported around the world, but never mentioned in Canada or the United States, that ISIS is funded by and controlled by and run by the United States. And they won't mention that. And there's also the story which I'm pushing and trying to get the media here in Victoria, especially CFAX, that's my favorite media, to cover the story of the connection between corporate America using um, a bank in which the grandfather and father of the two presidents, Bush, was involved, funneling money to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in order to get them started in the late 20s and early 30s. Now, they won't report that story, I think, because if people know that they did it then, they funded the Nazis. Corporate America helped fund the Nazis. If they did it then, then how can, why would we believe them about ISIS today? That's the importance of that story, and that's why they won't report it. Which, which goes back to my original comment that what greater enemy do we have than the corporate media? Lots to talk about there, Jack. Well, the thing is, you know, um, there's a summit now going on uh, in, I think it's in, in Peru, is it? And it's the you know they're discussing about the runaway climate change and and this is a fact of life. We see it, you know, on a weekly basis in the news, and often we see it in our weather here on the west coast. Uh, insurance companies have recognized it, and and estimate it's going to cost the Canadian economy several billion dollars a year. Uh, you know, the loss of property, injuries loss of life. This is all very serious stuff they're talking about. Very rarely do you ever see that talked about in the media. That's a story that I wish they would overdo. wish they would just talk too much about that. Uh, but these sort of stories take up that space in the paper. Uh, these stories, in my view, are made up. I've I, uh, been around long enough, read enough of them, going back a lot of years, and, and they all have the same smell. It looks like another, some type of undercover, you know, um, concoction of stories that's going to lead towards Canadians urging their government to uh, send soldiers to Syria or whatever war that they're promoting. And, uh, and as you say, the fear is the major contributor. People are just fearful. 
and they don't know what to do, so they'll they'll go along with the. Uh, yeah, you can see. I mean, I think we can see the manipulation of the Canadian public to create fear, to create anger, to divide us. I mean, the 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 constant pummeling of people who are Muslims in this country, the connection, con keeping connecting them to this. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslim people, our neighbors and friends and, and families, who speak out against this stuff all the time and they never get a word in the media, right? They're not given the chance to speak out against it. Maybe a little bit here, a little bit there, but this guy, the, the, the murderer from ISIS who wants to kill us, he's, he's all over the news. I don't know how we can stop them, but we've got to start by simply not believing them and, and understanding the way the media operates. It's got nothing to do with the news or truth or what's going on in the world. It's just propaganda. I think it's important that we talk about it. You know, uh, with that fear, people tend to, to not engage. They tend to withdraw, um, which only compounds more fear and f the sense of helplessness. The first thing to do, I think, is to talk about it and really get this out in the open. Uh, and if you really look at this story and, and really uh, the, the whole um, the, uh, the story about the shooting in Ottawa and, and the killing in Quebec and all that, there's so many huge gaps in that story that logically you would say, well, okay, something's up here. There's another agenda going on here because this doesn't flow. This does not seem like a way a person would act. And if you look at the similarities in this lone gunman or lone attacker scenario, time and time again, oh, by the way, they, they get shot in, in the end, so they can't be interviewed, <laughs> ask them what they were really up to. And you really have to wonder, well, isn't that convenient? They have to shoot them every time. And uh, if you look at the Boston attack, uh, the, the Mar Boston Marathon uh, bombing, uh, has, a, has a similar sort of story. Even what happened here in BC with, uh, with the attempted bombing at the legislature on July 1st last year and all that. None of those stories hold together on upon scrutiny. The thing to do is the public has to, we have to start talking about it and really looking at all the gaps and, and really feel comfortable with the fact that yeah, something's up, there's another agenda and we have to look, look for that agenda. Yeah, and, and we've got to build media, so that's, uh, that's up to people watching and, uh, and spread the word. I mean, there's lots of independent media in every town and city right across this country, and it's up to you to support it, to, to read it, watch it, and listen to it, and to support it financially. Um, you know, it's out there, it's always looking for money, it has no money, but it's, believe me, it, it, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything more important than people can do than to build a media in this country because if we don't, I think it's guaranteed that, uh, that we're going down the drain. I think there's it. more and more of uh, an appetite for, for free thinking. And if you look at these recent elections, municipal elections here locally, you had uh, Lisa Helps here in Victoria being elected mayor. Uh, then you have Richard Atfit, uh, Atwell and, and there's the mayor of Saanich who, who ousted Frank Leonard, who had been a mayor for 18 years there, and a you know, Liberal Party stalwart. And in Central Saanich, um, we have now Ryan Windsor as the mayor, uh, a new person in politics in Central Saanich, associated with the Green Party at one time. Uh, so we have these three individuals that are not tied to the traditional old uh, NDP or Liberal, uh, you know, uh, regimes that ran these local campaigns sort of in the background and had their candidates and really affected local politics. These are three people outside of that whole paradigm and there's a, quite a shift there, particularly in Saanich, uh, R Richard Atwell really pulled one off there to win that election that way. That's quite astonishing. It shows that there's people really starting to think about the issues and not just buying into the, into the line that they're reading in the paper and stuff. So I think now's the time to foster that and you know people are I think going to not be as tied to political parties which is really really important uh, and to really start thinking for themselves. Um, speaking of
political parties, uh, I want to talk something about the, you know, we all, we're always critical of the NDP, so I'll put yeah. in right now. Um, but I don't want to be critical of the NDP. I'm a member of the NDP. I believed in the NDP when I was young and, and foolish. But I want to believe again. Um, so it says here, th this is a pamphlet put out by the NDP. I just picked it up yesterday. On the back it says, the first past the post system is not serving the people of British Columbia. And that's in quotes. And it's from John Horgan, leader of the New Democratic Party. And he says underneath, or somebody says underneath, if elected government in 2017, the New Democrats will give British Columbians a vote on electoral reform so they can decide if they want a proportional representation system in place for the 2021 provincial election. The New Democrats would campaign in favor of the change that is put before the people. So in other words, um, they're saying that they support proportional representation. I think that's important. I commend the NDP on it. I commend John Horgan on it. And, you know, there's a lot of issues where we disagree on, but, but I'm, I'm with them on that. Well, you know, the problem with it, Jack, is that I remember uh, the NDP had a crack at it in 2006, and the Liberals uh, ran, a, uh, ran the same question. And uh, the NDP ran a backroom campaign to vote no for proportional representation. And uh, Carol James was the leader then. Uh, she was getting very poor advice. And I think some of those people were still there in the back rooms giving the same advice. Um, so I'm questioning their sincerity. You know, they had a crack. We did vote for proportional representation, and 57% of British Columbians wanted it. You know, you really don't have to run a referendum on this. Go ahead and initiate it. Say, if we are elected, we're going to begin the process of, of a, for the following election to be a proportional representation type election. You don't need any of the stuff in the middle because by the time that referendum is run, by the time they manipulate and spin it around and upside down, we don't know where it's going to go. You know, I, I, I honestly, given the, the history uh, of the party and how they've gone back on so many things, I'm, I'm really questioning this, their sincerity. Yeah, you can question the sincerity. I, I won't disagree with you. Uh, in terms of a referendum, I think a referendum would be important uh, because I think people deserve the vote, the, the right to vote on it. And it just has to be a fair question or questions and let's get the answer that the people of BC How really about this, want. Jack? If we're elected, we're going to initiate proportional representation for the following election. You don't need a referendum, Jack. We've already gone through that process. Put that on your platform, run with it, get a, um, a mandate to do it, and just go ahead and change the laws. You're the government, you don't have to. Well, all of a sudden they get all mamsy pamsy, have to run elect referendums on stuff. Where was a referendum on smart meters? Where, yeah, you're right, you where's know, a referendum on LNG? Where's all, all these multi-billion dollar projects that are just disasters for this province that in the background that NDP are supporting? And, and we're not getting a say on that. So uh, if, they, if they are serious about this, we've been down this road, uh, Jack, I think all they have to do is say, elect us and you're gonna have proportional representation. And then I'll, I'll respect them. I'll say, okay, I, there's something I can sink my teeth into. Okay, so we probably at this moment disagree on that one, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, Mount Pauly. Now, there's our liberal government friends who are in many ways to blame for this massive environmental disaster that will take decades and generations to work its way through our environment. It's a disaster of the most massive proportions it's completely gone from the news. It's like it never happened. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of very, very phony investigations going on about it, controlled by the very people who made it happen. The government is controlling the investigations. The government is to blame, along with the company. You know, I just read today that these dams are built to last in perpetuity. They're built, you know, built to last forever because that's how long this stuff remains dangerous. It's gonna remain dangerous 
forever. So in other words, when we build a mine like Mount Pauly and all the other mines in Canada, we're taking what comes and using it to build our cars and build our junk and just waste it and condemning future generations to pay the price because it's going to get loose. It's nightmarish in its stupidity. And for Christy Clark to do that to us and then not even have an investigation, I mean, this woman should be removed from office immediately for this and many, many other <coughs> things. She's, I mean, this province, the people of this province deserve a premier who works for us, not a corporate puppet. Sure, and you know, they, you know, these tailings ponds, Jack, don't they always leak? Don't they always, that's all I hear about. It must be some that aren't leaking. The thing is that if, if you took in the process of mining and it just as a cost of doing the, that, that uh, extracting that ore, you have to process all these dangerous chemicals and other metals. You can't just chuck them into a pile and leave them there. That, that, they're, they're digging it up. They should have to do something with it and take care of it. And also, and if they can't, then the mine it doesn't open. It doesn't open. And, in, and that's why they're building in BC, by the way, because almost every other jurisdiction wants stuff like that. And this BC is the last of the Wild West where there's no, no regulations. Number two, we have to have real environmental protection. And you know who's not offering it is the NDP. They're all excited about development. They all get their shiny hard hats on and, and their glasses and walk through these plants and stuff and get all excited. You know, the thing is that they have to be serious, serious about protecting the environment. And that means if you're going to elect us, and if they want to run a platform that's real, you say, vote for us, and we're going to do A, B, C, D about protecting you and mining. Real regulations, real enforcement, you know, create a you real ministry what? of the I environment. I don't know if you can regulate or, or protect us from these mines. I mean, once you do it, I don't know if the price can ever be so you're, you're just you're sending the price down in, into your children and your grandchildren our children and our grandchildren what's the sense of it maybe we just have to start really changing our entire lifestyle and moving back to something that's more compatible with the planet that we live on and if we destroy that planet there ain't nowhere else for us to go as far as I know and we're, yeah. we're destroying it like as fast as we possibly can Next topic? Well, all happy okay. topics. I mean, we, we saw an article about the Senate Committee in the United States uh, oh. issue report about the CIA torturing of, of detainees uh, since uh, September 1st, uh, 2001. And uh, scathing report, massive report, uh, outlining how the CIA did some very, very nasty people nasty things to a lot of people, some of whom were completely innocent. Most of whom were completely yeah. innocent. This is, these were war crimes of the greatest magnitude, yeah. supported by the media all over the place. I mean... Yeah. Well, the thing is, what's important there is that, you know, the CIA is still trying to defend themselves, but the evidence goes right against them. And by the way, they broke many laws, uh, in, you know, in many laws in the United States and international conventions about torture. There's there's nothing in the middle here. These people have to be fired. All those people that made those decisions should be not should not be in those p positions of authority. And of course, we're seeing just about the the opposite. The, they're just defiant. Uh, they're just not going to budge. Uh, the head of CIA is defending their actions, and that's really sad because he has to defend their actions because if he doesn't, he's going to prison. Possibly. I mean, these are war crimes. And we're all culpable. The whole story from, from you know, from the, uh, the attack of 9-11 of on, it's all a pack of lies. Yeah. And we've got to get beyond this because we can't allow these people to run our world anymore. Because I think we can see the direction they're, they're leading us to. It's, it's you know, from... From Lima, Peru, I think the report is that we're on the verge of making the planet uninhabitable. And it's not only climate change, it's a million other things. We're poisoning everything. I mean, th there was a story last week, the, the killer whales and the straits are dying. I mean, who can blame them? Everything is so polluted. Yeah. There was a little a picture in the paper today of a little, 
a little girl with the the princess from Britain who's visiting, yeah. nine years old, dead of ca di dead of cancer. Yeah. I mean, these are the corporations. They are the ones behind. You know, it's it's uh, Enbridge is sponsoring a run for the cure for the cancer cure. I mean, what a pathetic joke. You notice they never sponsor a run for prevention because they know they are the cause. <laughs> it's corporate industrialism that's the cause. And they're going to kill us all. And where is the media on that one? When the drug Vioxx killed 5,000 Canadians 10 or 15 years ago over a period of a few years, it was never even reported. But this punk from, from ISIS you know, the corporations are allowed to kill us by the corporate media. It never gets reported. The punk from ISIS is used to, to put fear into us because they want us afraid and they're going to use that fear for their own evil purposes, whatever they are. Yeah, I, corporations are what they are. You know, my, my biggest criticism is, is with, uh, with the political parties and, and people that are supposed to be going to bat for us. And obviously the liberals are a corporate party. You can understand their agenda. What really, really burns me is how, how the opposition acts. You know, they're there for us, Jack. Uh, you know, the NDP could get elected in a landslide just taking some progressive policies and not this mamsy pamsy sucking up to the corporate man every time. And John Horgan's just, he's using all these phrases and words, but you know, it's business as usual. Nothing's changing there. And it's so frustrating for people that are progressive, let's say in this province, that want something different, that there's no options for us. And the NDP say, oh, we have to do this in order to get elected. I don't buy that. They would get elected in a landslide if they had really stood up for the public and not, not just suck up, sucking up to the corporate masters every time. Walter, I agree with you. And we're out of time. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care, Jack. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum, being filmed on Wednesday, December the 10th. Um, our guest in this segment, once again, is Mike Sadawi. And we are going to be talking, Mike is a philosopher, accountant. Accountant, that's right. A great comedy. Accounting for philosophy. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about Agenda 21. Yes. And I know nothing about Agenda 21, except I've heard people say it's out there. Okay, well, I'm going to start off with some a bit of reading. Jack, brothers and sisters, as man who is under the guaranteed sovereign protection of the monarchy and sheriff, I want to talk about the United Nations G Agenda 21. So, uh, where did it all start, the G United Nations Agenda 21? You know, where did the United Nations start? Well, a quick rundown is the former runner to uh, United Nations was the League of Nations, 1919. Uh, that was right after the First World War. It, the League of Nations was to solve everything that the First World War screwed up. Uh, the UN was, crea was created, the United Nations, in 1945, right after World War II, with the same idea, we're going to make everything fine now. Now, the interesting thing is that the League of Nations was created by the Rockefeller family. They were responsible for the funding of the entire operation. All right? Now it's clear that the Rockefeller and Rothschild families have created the United Nations. Uh, without them, the development of the global organization was not possible, couldn't be possible. All right. <clears throat> so that's who, you know, he uh, who pays the piper calls the tune. Rockefeller and Rothschilds financed, funded, built it all. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to go into what, what is the United Nations Agenda 21 in one easy lesson. Uh, first of all, what's sustainable development? According to the authors, the objective of sustainable development is to integrate economic, social, and environmental policies in order to achieve reduced consumption, social equality, and the preservation and restoration of the biodiversity. All right? Well, to, this, that sounds good. It's wonderful. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what, and for social equality, social justice, same thing, is described as the right and opportunity of all people to uh, benefit equally from the resources afforded us by the society and, and the environment. Uh, it's also redistribu redistribution of wealth. We heard that from Obama. Private property is a social injustice since not everyone can build wealth from it. National sovereignty is a social injustice, right from the United Nations. Uh, but 
Universal health care is a social justice because it can kill you before you're born or when you're old and in between. All parts of Agenda 21, this is all part of Agenda 21 policy. <coughs> okay, um, but there's parts <coughs> in there that I'd agree with, I think, okay. but not that I know anything about it or what it means. Because well, I'm going on to, yeah, okay. to define this okay. thing. So uh, uh, one of the things is to uh, economic prosperity, PPP, uh, public-private partnerships, special dealings between government and certain chosen corporations which get tax breaks, grants, and government's power of eminent domain and implementation of su sustainable policy government sanctioned monopolies. This is right from the UN, worldwide. Who is behind it? Well, there's this local governments for su sustainability uh, who pay dues to can, provide... Can I, just, can I just ask you a question? Are they saying that P3s are good or bad? Well, if you like, uh, if you like uh, special deals between government and chosen uh, uh, corporations, I guess it's good for the corporations. Uh, they get grants, government money, all subsidized and sanctioned for their own monopolies. So does Agenda 21 say... This is all from the UN. Okay, but yeah. so is Agenda 21 saying P3s are good? For them, and corporations, and governments, but so not for so, you. So, <laughs> ag so Agenda 21 supports P3s? It, it's in their documents that this is, you're, you're led that way. This is all pushed that way. Okay, okay. Everything's the top down. That's how it all works. The top is UN, then Canada, then USA, then... Uh, funded by the Rockefellers and Rothschilds, and they call the tune. Anyway, who's behind it? These uh, uh, local governments of sustainability, and what they do is they provide local communities with plans, software, training, and everything. So these guys swoop in, parachute in, and show every town all across the world how to do this wonderful thing. Uh, it's the uh, foundation of government grants that drive the process, okay? Government grants drive it all. So, uh, gov so government grants drive Agenda 21. Yes, yes. But what is Agenda 21? I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's like who's we on first? That, yeah. <laughs> so uh, where did it originate? The term sus uh, sustainable development is the first introduced to the world in 87 on a report uh, produced by the United Nations World Commission on the Environment and Development, authored by GRO, G -R -O, Harlem, oh, yes, VP yes. of the World Socialist Party <laughs> at the top running this agenda. The Socialist Party, first offered as an official UN policy in 1992. The document called UN Sustainable Development Agenda 21, issued at the UN's Earth Summit, totally today referred to simply as Agenda 21. Okay? So uh, now, uh, what gives Agenda 21 authority? More than 178 nations adopted Agenda 21 as official policy during this, uh, at the Earth Summit. That's including USA, Canada, everyone. Uh, uh, so Bush we, ha we have document. signed on to Agenda yes. 21. Uh, every major country. You can think oh, of 178 really? countries and Canada's one of them. So and you're, and we're going to find out shortly what it is that we signed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now we signed uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Clinton also endorsed the Agenda 21 when he, uh, Executive Order 1285-8, to create no harmonization between the 21 and uh, sustainable development, okay? So now sustainable development is emerging as a government policy in every town, country, and state in the nation, all right? So now, here's revealing quotes from the planners. Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on earth it calls for specific changes in all activities of all people. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all humans, unlike anything the world has ever seen. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there, no one fully understands how or even if it's sustainable, but there's a growing consensus that it must, consensus that it must be accompanied accomplished at the local level if it's ever to be achieved globally. So okay, at every little local level, they're enforcing these issues. What are, do I know what the issues are? Or every we're, we're, human being on Earth right. uh, has to change. That's okay, the well, issue. And this is the change that okay. they're telling you you're going to do. Okay. Uh, Agenda 21 in private property. Now this is for every rich guy, the richest to the poorest. Agenda 21 in private property. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and in 
for influences of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth. Therefore, contributes to social injustice. Private property, any business, anything is socially unjust. Private land use decisions are often driven by strong economic incentives that result in several ecological and aesthetic consequences. The key to overcoming it is through the government, of course. Uh, current lifestyles. Okay, but and can, can we go into that? No, I'll just two okay, more minutes. Okay. Okay. Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. We need a new collaborative decision process that leads to better decisions, quicker and everything. As long as government does it, it'll be great. Individu individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. We've heard that before. We must make so. We must make this place an insecure and inhospitable, uh, uh, as insecure and inhospitable place for capitalists and their projects. We must reclaim, reclaim the roads, the plowed lands, halt dam construction, tear down existing dams, free shackled rivers, and return to wilderness millions of tens of millions of acres, or presently that are presently settled land. But uh, isn't what that, is not is, sustainable? Okay. What is not sustainable? The United Nations is saying what is not sustainable? Ski runs, grazing of livestock, plowing of soil, building fences, industry, single-family homes, paved and tarred roads, logging activities, dams and re reservoirs, power line constructions, economic systems that f uh, fail to set proper values on the environment. These are not sustainable. Must it's true, they're not. Uh, okay, in the last part, uh, Okay. Hide Agenda 21's UN's roots from the people. Okay. Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many conspiracy fixated groups and individuals. Uh, the, the, uh, this segment of our society who fear one world government and a UN invasion of the USA and other countries through our individual freedom will be stripped away, uh, would actively work to defeat any elected official or who joined the conspiracy by undertaking Agenda 21. So we will not call our process Agenda 21, we will call it something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth, smart meters and so on. All right? So I'm gonna stop there and let you ask some questions. I got more, okay. lots more. But. All right, so what they're saying from the top down, Where Rockefeller, do Rothschild, okay. and the Queen <laughs> is telling you, you, uh, you will know your dams and roads are going to be plowed under. We're finishing everything off for you. How's okay. that? Now that's why you can't get anything done. That's why you can't elect nothing because it's all coming from the top down. Doesn't matter what you say down here. See, they pour in millions. Uh, everybody's got their own secret bank accounts. You know. So okay, but okay. it seems to me like when you read through that. Yeah. I think I agree with a lot of it. Our, our, okay. our lifestyle is unsustainable, uh, yes. for example. Isn't that? Oh, it sounds so cute, isn't it? But, but now, isn't it true? Now, I want to visualize Rockefeller and the Rothschilds living in a dumpster like you. That's, <laughs> that's what I want. These people telling me to live in a dumpster, uh, not even have a paved road, and no electricity. So oh, we're I mean, back to, to, you know. Oh, so it's so only for us. Exempt. Well, well, these people are exempt, you know, like your members of, you know, senators and members of parliament, they're, they're exempt for all the... Uh, okay, well, that's another you. story. Okay. You see, that's the story. Okay. okay. So the Queen isn't dropping uh, one castle. The, the Rothschilds and, and Rockefellers aren't missing a meal. They're not going to pull their belt any damn tighter. Matter of fact, they're taking over the land that they're taking from you because uh, you're not allowed to own private property, see? You're a communist. Uh, you're not allowed to uh, have uh, air conditioning. You're not allowed to eat meat. You're not allowed any of that. And but, if you dare, but, you'll be locked up. But they are, or they will be under Agenda 21. They can continue as... They're telling you, you will be locked up if you dare to have private property. But how about them? They're exempt. <laughs> they're the Queen and the Rothschilds. And the, what, do you think they're going to write something like this and put themselves in a dumpster? What, are you nuts? <laughs> you're gonna, they're going to li live from hand to foot, no electricity, by candlelight reading their, reading their agendas? Is that what they're going to do? <laughs> It's ridiculous. <laughs> of course they're exempt. You know, it's not for me, it's for you. I, I have to handle you herd, herd of people, and so they take over your land. They get it all, 
and uh, Agenda 21, if you look at the map, all the peoples are herded into the coastal areas and all the middle of, uh, of North America is, uh, will be land that you can't go on and all owned by the queen. Just like you have crown land here, uh, you can't really buy anything, you can't do anything there, all right? So uh, if you think that, uh, so anybody's got any wealth at all, that wealth itself is discriminatory for you peasants, you see, yeah. but for us up here, it's a different story, you see. They all strut around, you see, that's, that's the whole thing. So I think you, now, you know, it's, okay, so they took away your money, they took away everything else, but they're a little meaner than that. Now, agenda, uh, um, now the United Nations was, uh, uh, they hired uh, Huxley, right? Julian Huxley, to, uh, as an executive to steer all of this, who heads the agenda. Now, Huxley is, uh, is a brother of uh, Otis Huxley, who wrote Brave New, World, Brave New World Revisited. You need to read 1984, Brave New World, and Brave New World Revisited. Those last two are made by Otis Huxley. If you want to see what they're doing in our society today, you read Brave New World, and you'll see that they drug people up all the time in that particular so-called fiction, but it's a reality. That's their blueprint. Uh, uh, if a girl went out with a guy more than one week, then you're, you're considered weird, and, and so the destruction of the family, all of that's all in the book. So, the, so they follow this particular thing. Now, one of the things that Huxley is, and all those cats on top are, is, uh, is uh, they call themselves eugenics, right? Now, eugenics, well, who is that? What is that? Well, uh, Margaret Sanger, the, uh, the uh, parenthood founder of eugenics, uh, says the most merciful thing that a large family uh, does to one of its infant members is to kill it because large families are a drain on society. So Margaret Sanger has no problem saying you've got to kill it. She then says, uh, uh, the wickedness of creating large families, and uh, it goes on into it, the families tend to involve poverty and illness. It's better that everyone involved, if a child, for everyone involved, if a child life is snuffed out before he or she has a chance to give us these difficulties of, uh, you know, the environment. Uh, we should apply stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation uh, uh, to populations. And uh, uh, one other thing here. Uh, give give uh, people with bad genes in our population the choice of segregation or sterilization. Uh, now here's a really good thing here. Uh, we should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to a Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want to go out in the world and tell, we don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea ever occurs to any one of his members in church. So, not only do they want your land, not only are you, and not only that, uh, they're eliminating all countries. The idea of having a country, that's injustice, they're calling it. There's going to be just the one thing. Oh, and they will rule it. Uh, of course, the queen. I mean, you know, the, the special people. Whoever, you know. yeah. <laughs> it's Huxley, it's the Rothschilds and, and Rockefellers. You could, now, Agenda 21, you can look it up. There's Agenda 21 for dummies on YouTube, and you'll see all these people talk to you about it. Uh, so they want to sterilize you. That's what all these vaccines are about. That's why they want to force vaccines. There are sterilants in there. There's cancer causing in there. They want to reduce the population. And this is the, these are the people that are ahead of it. These are the people, these are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the messages uh, that are sent out and are still in force today, right? via these particular people that start up, the well, United uh, Nations. Yes, there are. And we're all coming under the United Nations. We're going to, Canada, USA, and Mexico is no more, right? We're going to be like EU. We're going to be the nor Northern EU. It, it's, all, it's all written down. It's already over, right? So, uh, you know, you can forget about voting. You can forget about the whole works. Okay, so what can we do? We've got 45 seconds left. What well, can we do? You know what Agenda 21 is? We just started it. Now we're going to, let's go to the top. Start saying who's responsible. Never mind the people beneath you. Those are the people responsible. Those are the ones that need to be targeted. And Agenda 21 is what everybody needs to know. That uh, you no longer have a country. You no longer have private property. You will not be in business. There is no middle class uh, because you're, you're, you're the one in, in responsible for the environment. And not only that, if you keep talking about this global warming, it too is a hoax. It's these same people. <laughs> Why do you believe these? 
certified known liars. <laughs> Like they said in the end there, we're going to, we can't tell you it's Agenda to United Nations. We're going to call it smart growth. We're going to call it anything else because once people find out, then they're finished. Once they know who's doing it. And we're finished. And we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike Sadawi. <laughs> Agenda 21, you know, I keep hearing about it and I'm sure you do too. Um, let's, we should find out more of what it is. Agenda 21 for dummies. Just look it up. <laughs> Thanks for watching Citizens Forum. Hello and welcome to the last segment of Citizens Forum being filmed on Wednesday, December the 10th. I'd like to thank again the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew that makes it all possible. Um, we're going to be talking about a petition that was, well we're going to be talking about 9-11. A week ago a petition was tabled and our guest is Elizabeth Woodward and Elizabeth is with a group called the Consensus Panel which is a very important group within the 9-11 movement and a, a group, let's say, of experts doing their level best to present expert evidence. I'm going to start by reading a few words of the petition that was presented to Parliament and then maybe you can introduce some of the, the consensus panel members and talk about... Certainly. So this was in the petition that was presented to Parliament about 9-11. There is sufficient doubt about the omissions and inconsistencies in the official United States of America 9-11 Commission report to show that 9-11 was an act of state-sponsored terrorism. Foremost, the official United States of America 9-11 Commission report omits new forensic evidence of the use of explosives that might have been the actual cause of the destruction of the World Trade Center Twin Towers and the collapse of the third World Trade Center Building 7. So three, three buildings fell. Building 7 was the third. And as a result, Canada, now being a partner with the United States of America in the global war of terror, therefore has a responsibility to verify the findings of the United States of America 9-11 Commission report before committing our military and other resources to the conflict. Well, I would agree with that. 100 percent. So Elizabeth Woodworth, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the consensus? Sure. sure. The, the consensus panel, 9-11 consensus panel, which is at consensus911.org, was formulated three years ago, founded by myself and Dr. David Ray Griffin, who's the t top scholar in the 9-11 truth community. He's been nominated three times for the Nobel Prize in Europe for his 10 books on 9-11. So we decided that we would start this consensus panel which uses a medical model for establishing, for reviewing evidence. The same as if the model that doctors use when they're on their panels and <coughs> review committees to establish consensus points about medicine. So we have worked with 24, uh, 22 panelists, international, they're all over the world, and we've developed and we're always blind to one another when we, when we are reviewing evidence. It goes through three rounds of review and we have developed 44 points of evidence that uh, contradict the claims of the 9-11 uh, Commission report, which is the report that the government issued in 2004 explaining how 9-11 happened. So 44 points of evidence from 22 professionals and these people are, uh, they're academics mostly, they're six PhDs, um, there are three engineers, there are a couple of NASA people on the panel, there are three airline pilots that deal with the flights, there are three journalists, there's a medical doctor, and so it's a, it's a very um, sophisticated panel and it has some very good backing in its honorary members, which include the honorary president of the Italian Supreme Court and the longest sitting member of British Parliament and Lynn Margulis before her death. So these people have really good credentials and they understand the importance of getting to the truth about 9-11 which has changed our world into a global war on terror and is trotted out almost every day in the news around the world. So we're questioning the, the, the fundamental underlying story. That's what we do. And when the commission, when the um, uh, this petition was actually presented in Parliament, 
last week, a week ago today, um, that meant that suddenly we had something that we could use to actually get hold of for the news, to get into the news, because the news media will not cover 9-11 evidence. They cover, what they do is they look at, uh, if anybody tries to say anything about 9-11, they, they say they're a nutter or they're a fruitcake or something like that. They, uh, it's an ad hominem attack, and the, the discussion is never about the evidence. So today, uh, three, uh, three of the uh, uh, academically based organizations uh, made arrangements to have a press conference in the Ottawa Press Gallery, uh, which is where, uh, and we sent out um, a press release, and the media came to the press gallery, and the three organizations that were represented there. Uh, the first was Rethink911.ca, which is a, 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 a really good little Canadian organization that actually presented the petition. It was they, they, they wrote the petition and they've been trying to get it into Parliament for several years. David Long is the CEO. He's a, a businessman, a very smart fellow. David Long was actually at the towers uh, on 9-11. He was a survivor. so he. He went through the whole sort of gut reaction thing and has been trying ever since to get the truth out. The second or, um, academic organization that uh, was represented today in the press conference was Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which has 2,300 uh, uh, architects and engineers calling for a new investigation based on the evidence for controlled demolition. Um, so they're saying that the three buildings were brought down on 9-11 by controlled demolition. This yes. 2,300 architects and engineers. Yeah, that many. And, you know, this just goes on and on and on, and the world is being drawn into never-ending war and terror and fear. It's impacting very strongly in Canada now. And here's 2,300 architects and engineers saying the whole thing that it's based on, the attack of 9-11, is, is phony. That's, that's exactly right. And uh, Richard Gage, there, the, the founder, has spoken in Canada. He's spoken even in Victoria a number of times. And the third organization is the one that I belong to and co-founded, which is the, I just described as the 9-11 Consensus Panel. So I'd like to... Now, what happened uh, after the, as a result of this press conference was something we've been hoping would happen for a long time, and that is that one of the major n television agencies actually arrived with their camera and they reported. Uh, and Dr. Graham McQueen, um, who is a professor, who was he, he studied at Harvard University. He studied uh, Buddhist studies at his PhD is in Buddhist studies at Harvard, and he he taught for 30 years at McMaster University and in peace studies. And he's been a member of the 9-11 consensus panel since it started. And so he went from Hamilton to Ottawa today and, and, and Global TV Network um, actually broadcast his remarks. And so here we have a professor talking to the people of Canada. And I'd like to sort of say what, some of what he said today. Yeah, please do. Um, he said, um, that he, he said that tor he referred to this torture um, uh, report that's just come out from the U.S. Senate and, it, you know, re quite a damning report about the, the torture that was conducted under the Bush administration. And uh, Dr. McQueen said that torture testimony occupies a central position in the 9-11 Commission report, which is the report that our panel has been criticizing with its 44 points. And, for example, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was suffocated by water dozens of times. You've probably heard that, Jack. His testimony would never have been accepted in any decent court, nor is it reliable. This is what the torture report is saying. Like, anything that is forced out of people by torture isn't reliable testimony. But this testimony is essential to the 9-11 Commission report's findings. And and this is one big reason why we need a new parliamentary review, which is what 
the petition asked of Parliament for a new parliamentary review into the 9-11 Commission report, which is based on terror, on, on torture, I should say. So um, the, Dr. McQueen explained to Global and, and to the, the assembled reporters that the panel's job, our panel, is to systematically review evidence using an established medical model to see if there are criticisms of the official account that are sound and pass rigorous inspection. And he said that an examination of these 44 points reveals that neither the 9-11 Commission nor FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, nor the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who produced reports on the, the way the buildings fell, none of them have used standard research methods, such as we use in the consensus panel, based on medical research met methods. So, and then Dr. McQueen is quite an expert on the uh, eyewitness reports uh, from the people who were present at the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the day of 9-11, seeing the towers, hearing the explosions. And those eyewitnesses, a lot of them are uh, uh, on uh, the New York Times website. Like all the oral histories of the, of the firemen and the uh, medical attendants and paramedics and so on that came to the scene, uh, they took, they took uh, interviews from everybody. And Dr. McQueen has analyzed all those interviews, and he says that there are a hundred eyewitnesses who perceived explosions in the Twin Towers during their destruction. Some of them were actually blown across the room by these explosions. In the lobby, for example, like they, the, 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 the planes hit up around the 75th and the 90th floors, but there were enormous explosions in the lobbies, and the windows were all blown out. And so he's the expert um, in that. And if, if you go to the consensus panel at consensus911.org, you can follow that up. Yeah, so it says the official reports do not examine a single one of these 100 eyewitnesses who, who perceived explosions. The eyewitnesses have, in effect, been silenced. That's right. And that's, yeah. that's the official story. That's the official story. It's a load of nonsense but it is so powerfully protected by the people who run this country and the United States that not a word of truth is ever allowed. But now, because of this petition, and the petition is asking Parliament to investigate because we are involved in a war that is based on, originally, the attacks of 9-11. Exactly. And I think they, that with, with the press conference backing up in Parliament, the press conference in the in the parliamentary uh, gallery backing up the petition today. I think that's a significant step forward for Canadians to start looking at the evidence rather than <coughs> looking at the people who carry the evidence and, and calling them names, which has been the case for so long. Yeah. So this is Dr. Graham McQueen who spoke at the press conference and whose comments were carried by Global TV. That's and right. I'll just read the last, the second last paragraph of what you've written here. Um, At this moment, when Canada risks major military involvement within the war on terror, I urge all those who wish to know the facts about September 11th, 2001, to support a parliamentary review. Well, I mean, I have almost completely lost faith in our parliament. Is there any realistic hope that our parliamentarians have the ability to stand up and actually do anything? I think that ultimately depends on whether the people of Canada will ever get the evidence that they need to insist that their representatives do something, that they listen and look at, at what is actually known about the September 11th attacks. And so that's why it's important for you and, and uh, Global TV and every other media in Canada to suddenly say, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to our population to let them know what evidence has been assembled by some very, very serious people and in turn for the Canadians to say, all right, now we've got good investigative journalism, 
we want we really want to go into this and look to see what can be done at this point in time to try to reverse some of the damage that has been done by 9-11. Well, the media has had that responsibility for, you know, years already and then they haven't followed up on it. I think it's up to Canadians and that's the people watching this show and tell your friends, tell your family to start contacting the media and your parliamentarians and asking for just the information. Give us the information. Tell us the truth about the consensus panel. And again, it's, uh, what's the website for it's the... Cons it's consensus911.org. And when you get to that, there's, on the left margin, you can see the panel members, the honorary members, and then the consensus points, the 44 consensus the points. The points are there. I think millions of us know that the official story, well, I'd say the official story is a complete pack of lies, but a lot of people won't say that. But, but certainly, I think most Canadians would say, yeah, we should have an independent, honest, open investigation into what actually happened on the day of 9-11 and leading up to it. Because the official story simply, there's a lot of questions. And therefore, there has to be an investigation to find out the truth. Because this issue has dominated the planet for the last 12, 13 years. And we've got to get back on the right track because we've got other problems that we have to face up and deal with. You know, Jack, that I, I couldn't agree with you more about that. Not, the, the global war on terror has been on the front burner. Uh, Syria, Ir Iraq, uh, Iran, it all goes back to 9-11. In the meantime, we're, we're heading for this emergency global warming catastrophe. And it's all about oil. Like, if there were no oil in the Middle East, we wouldn't be over there. We wouldn't have had 9-11. And so we're still there. At the same time, oil is destroying our planet, the, the burning of fossil fuels. And, and these forces that benefit from this profitably, they, they're just set in place. And it's up to the rest of us to resist and say, look, we've got to stop. We've got to stop believing in the global war on terror. We've got to pull back and start focusing on the damage that fossil fuels are doing, and then focus on developing a rich economy that can be fully employed, developing sustainable energy. Yeah. And we've got, I mean, climate change is one part of it, but the ongoing massive destruction of the planet in a thousand and million different ways, we've just got to change. And maybe it's already too late, but we've got to change. And, and this 9-11 issue, we've got to put that aside and somehow how do you apologize to the people of the Middle East who have been killed by the hundreds of thousands for, for nothing because of this pack of lies? Elizabeth Woodworth, thank you very much. Thanks to all the people around the world who have worked so hard for years on the 9-11 issue. Maybe this is a moment, uh, if Global TV, thanks to Global TV for carrying this, maybe this is a moment where we can start to change in right directions. And it's, it's up to you, it's up to us. Thanks very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.